Hey everybody, it's Eric Newcomer. Welcome to Newcomer. I have a great episode. I spoke with venture capitalist John Turo, a partner at Madrona, a former product manager in AI machine learning at Amazon. He's someone who really helps me. He helped me prepare for the Cerebral Valley AI Summit. And so now happy to let you hear directly from him, someone who can really translate the inner workings of cloud and Amazon Web Services and machine learning to the masses. So great to get to talk to John and talk about Amazon Bedrock, their new partnership with Anthropic and Stable Diffusion, the developments in open source, some of the complications of chaining models. And then we get into baby AGI towards the end of the episode. I think it was a great one. So give it a listen. Before we get to the episode, a word from our sponsor. Newcomer is brought to you by Vanta. To close and grow major customers, you have to earn trust. But demonstrating your security and compliance can be time-consuming, tedious, and expensive. Until you use Vanta. Vanta automates up to 90% of the work for the most sought-after security and privacy standards. Save time and money on compliance with Vanta's enterprise-ready trust management platform. For a limited time, newcomer listeners get $1,000 off Vanta. Go to vanta.com slash newcomer to get started. Now, our episode. Welcome to the podcast. I feel like we talked a lot in the lead up to the conference. I've been downloading my listeners on AI World, but I feel like everything moves so fast when we started talking about what we talk about this week. It's like, oh my God, the world has already changed since Cerebral Valley. Anyway, welcome. Hey, Eric. Great to be here with you. <laughs> Before we get into like our slate, there's a lot to talk about because, you know, Amazon is making big moves. I think, you know, I've talked a lot about open source there's a lot more there competition foundation models and maybe we'll end a little bit with baby agi but before we get into any of that can you just talk about you know you were a founder and then at amazon can you talk about working on product at amazon a little bit and getting into vc just a little sort of quick background on yourself for people yeah sure so i'm a partner at madrona venture group for an early stage firm i invest in ai companies and data companies who build products that customers love. And before this, you know, I've been a VC for about 14 months, a very short period of time. I spent almost 10 years at AWS, where I was a product leader in AI ML, edge compute, IoT, and data. And that was really a very special time and place and learning experience for me because at Amazon, the role of product is holy. It's who is our customer and what problem does she want to solve? And therefore, what should we build? And how do we build a really big business on top of that? And I was fortunate to work with some really talented teams and some really special customers in exotic new technologies. What was machine learning like at the time in Amazon Web Services? Like what? Because we're about to really dive into that in a second, but like what? historically has been the capability of AWS when it comes to AI and machine learning tools. So, you know, you want to back up even a little bit further that Amazon has been an early pioneer in machine learning from almost the beginning in terms of suggesting, you know, books and products you should buy and logistics optimizations and all kinds of other things. Machine learning for the purpose of Amazon consuming it to serve its own customers better. And so there's a really long and rich history of innovation there. In AWS, there's what's been considered a layer cake of AI ML offerings, where at the lowest level, there's really broad support for compute in GPUs and really fast network to do training and inference, both on third-party silicon from NVIDIA and Intel, and also first-party silicon from Amazon with popular frameworks like PyTorch and MXNet and TensorFlow. The next layer is sort of a, a flagship platform called SageMaker, okay. which is really useful. That's what everybody's for, striking. All the AI companies are trying to strike partnerships with SageMaker right now, right? SageMaker is a platform for training and inference and pipelines and data for companies who want to train and execute their own machine learning models. 
and it's been explosively successful. Customers in almost every industry you can imagine use SageMaker to train and execute their models. And that's sort of the cutting edge of AWS sort of up to today recently? It's very, very advanced. There's a third layer too of proprietary AI services where AWS uses the underlying technologies to offer higher order functionality to its customers for hmm. computer vision and document AI and speech to text and text to speech and call center analytics and the list goes on. And so depending on how customers want to consume these technologies, they have been able to choose where in the layer cake they want to start. Great. And I promise the listener, I find, you know, the cloud computing services extremely, it's hard to follow if you're not buying them, but you know, I brought you on because I feel like the best I've found at explaining them to people. And now that you're in venture world, you know, sort of the Amazon world, but then, you know, now you have to talk to everybody else all the time. That's right. Madrona, are, you guys invest in Runway, which is obviously super hot right now. And then in the data space, Mother Duck. So I start paying attention to VCs when it's like, oh, those are two buzzy companies at the moment, definitely in very that's different right. spaces. All right. So so that that's some background on you and sort of what Amazon has been working on. But like the news of this week is Amazon Bedrock. Basically, you know, Microsoft obviously had this huge partnership with OpenAI $10 billion sort of investment has given Microsoft's cloud offering Azure this huge head start. And in this week, Amazon responds. Can you sort of explain the response and then we'll sort of assess whether we think it's competitive? Yeah, sure. So Amazon announced a slew of generative AI announcements on Thursday, April 13th the centerpiece of which was called Amazon Bedrock. And Amazon Bedrock is a service that allows you to access large language models via API as an AWS customer inside your own cloud environment, inside your own security envelope. And in classic Amazon fashion, there is a wide selection of which models you can choose. You can choose a first party model from Amazon, a family of models, which are called Titan. And there is also a selection of really powerful third party models from AI21, from Stability AI, and perhaps most surprising of all from Anthropic, which is and an historically is kind of aligned to Google. The large language model, or now people are saying FM, foundation model, that I think most people today think is the closest competitor to OpenAI. Do you agree with that? I mean, so that that in particular was a notable one, that partnership, right? That's right. I think people are excited about Anthropic, certainly because of the amount of capital and compute and talent resources that they have to bring to bear. Certainly indicate a very high level of ambition to compete. TechCrunch reported they want like $5 billion dollars and then, you know, they've raised like 300 or something from Google, it seems. Right. So they, they have capital, they have access to compute, and they have talent, which allow them to be ambitious about the frontier of capabilities in the way that OpenAI is ambitious about that. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, a company can announce a partnership and, you know, you get a lot of sexy names. Like, what's your sense of how serious Bedrock is and what this means for Microsoft too. So I think the key here is that senior leaders of enterprises are deciding how to structure their cloud partnerships. Am I gonna be all in with one cloud provider? Am I gonna split my workloads across clouds? Which pieces of which workloads will go to which clouds? And that's one reason why AI and AI capabilities are so important because they're going to be critical for the next generation of almost any kind of application in almost any kind of vertical. And here, AWS is signaling that you're going to be able to get the most advanced models and a wide selection of them right here on AWS. That's a show of strength. 
the key is like you can and you were sort of explaining this to me before so i'm cribbing from you but you know you're keeping it in sort of the security of amazon web services so you know it's like safe and you're not like exiting that service or am i butchering that so there's a concept of what i call the security envelope the virtual private cloud that for enterprise customers who believe this is important which is increasing number of them the data of that enterprise should not traverse the open internet it should stay within a security boundary defined for that customer inside the cloud that they're using for a given workload and for amazon it's sort of like you buy aws stuff from us you don't need to go out and like venture out when you have you know these ai problems and buy something from someone else you just stay in our world and integrate with people like Anthropic or Stable Diffusion, and then when you say Amazon's customer, right? I mean, that's sort of that's the, right. the logic. That's right. And so the customers can, they can use their AWS environment. They can use their AWS virtual private cloud. The bundling and the pricing stuff is not yet clear, but there may be some benefits there as well. Microsoft has GPT-4, you know what I mean? And I think the sense is still that it's pretty far ahead of everybody else. Like Amazon can tack on as many partnerships as it wants. If it doesn't have GPT-4, is it just sort of uncompetitive? So the developer excitement about GPT-4, it's hard to overstate. It's a very powerful piece of technology. And... So I think initially at the moment, the fact that Bedrock lacks GPT-4 or a real answer to GPT-4 is a drawback. The fact that they have Anthropic among others, including these other sophisticated players, Stability AI, AI21, and Amazon itself, these are kind of multiple shots on goal and sort of a signal that things are going in that direction. As you discussed before, right. Anthropic well, yeah. is credibly... AI, we don't know what the deal with Microsoft is, but like OpenAI could, I guess, partner with Amazon if they're doing this at some point. I don't know what the I don't know what the deal would be. Certainly there's a distribution advantage to making your models available to customers on what is still the biggest cloud. But that's gonna be a question for AWS and OpenAI to work out. So there's sort of the strategic question for cloud providers of like how much I've integrated AI stuff into my offering. There's this sort of separate and related competitive situation, which is there's a ton of demand for GPUs, like particularly NVIDIA, what they're A100s, they're going to be H100 soon, right? These That's data right. center chips. And so, you know, they're selling them, NVIDIA is selling them, Oracle selling them, like do you have much of a read on where everyone's positioned in terms of just making a lot of money off of this GPU arms race? Well, NVIDIA is certainly positioned very well. <laughs> yeah. And people are like, why don't they make more? You know, they're, they seem like very consumer oriented, not enough of the enterprise chips. What's astonishing is that we still seem to be supply constrained on silicon. And you even hear about companies as they scale trying to do clever things to secure access to GPUs. It is a major competitive advantage. Clever thing? That seems euphemistic. Or... It, well, it is euphemistic in terms of striking deals, either compute for equity right. or strategic alignments or what have you. But it is a primary CEO and board level agenda for a large and growing AI company to make sure I have enough, pick your metaphor, real estate to keep building on, fuel for my engine. So, I mean, yeah, these big cloud companies have an opportunity to get equity in a bunch of cool startups in exchange. Somebody referred to it as like left pocket, right pocket, or even more uncharitably, I've heard it referred to as like revenue round tripping. I mean, there is sort of a dynamic where it's, if you know, like the Google investment in Anthropic, money's flowing out, but money's going to flow right back to me. I mean, that's the same with Microsoft and OpenAI. 
it makes sense for everybody. I don't know. Do you have any observations into the dynamic or just makes other hard for other people to get GPU access? You know, the information covered recently that even the mighty Amazon, Microsoft, and Google are all supply constrained on GPUs. Astonishing to imagine that. <laughs> right. Astonishing. And having to make choices about starving one hand to fill the other hand. A startup founder was sort of explained to me that in some ways the GPUs don't run quite like the compute cloud. Like it's not quite as liquid. It's like harder to give some to one company and some to the other. Whereas companies using the GPUs need to get a big block of them, which makes it harder to spread it around, right? Do you get a sense of like if they're just sort of companies sort of like hoarding access because when they need a lot of it, they need that capacity? I shouldn't comment about the state of what's called serverless GPU. Okay. Except to say that's sort of the holy grail. Everybody would okay. like to have right. serverless GPU and right. it's hard. But it does mean that sophisticated companies are hoarding access to GPU and placing advanced orders and hoarding advanced orders right. because it's so clear that we're just not going to have enough for right. the foreseeable future. We've talked about sort of Amazon with Bedrock, the partnerships, sort of this GPU race, the new NVIDIA chips coming on that everybody's excited about. I feel like, you know, you wrote this great piece, I don't know, two weeks ago now or what on open source. And already it's like, oh, there's a bunch of new stuff that's happened. And just to summarize for the audience, like I think a big theme at the conference in some ways was that there are these sort of foundation model companies that are closed and trying to compete. But then there's a whole sort of almost alliance of open source companies, whether it was Hugging Face or like Replit or Stability AI or, you know, Runway even has sort of some open source elements competing. So there's an interesting sort of tension between the closed and the broader open source. What's your view of the strength of that open source alliance in AI right now? Yeah. So one way to think about it is that there's kind of a proprietary world and an open source world. And the proprietary world includes models that are fully owned and managed. OpenAI is a great example of that. In the open source world, which is sort of organized around hugging face, open source models are shared and remixable. And you can either download them and run them off the shelf, or you can retrain them or modify them. And some of the popular ones include Bloom or OPT. And there have been more recent ones from Facebook called Llama, which spawned a L -L -A -M -A, whole new- L-L-A-M-A, right? Yeah. L-L-A-M-A, it's an LLM joke. <laughs> and there is an enormous pace of innovation and enormous amount of energy in this space. As an example, the CEO of Hugging Face organized a meetup in San Francisco some two weeks ago. And in a bit less than a week, there were 5,000 RSVPs, some 4,700. Insane. We did it at the Exploratorium. And the excitement around it is because of control and flexibility. Companies that may not have as much galactic technical capability as somebody like OpenAI can take one of these models off the shelf and start from that place and apply their own capabilities and their own data. Here's an example. Bloomberg used a model off the shelf called Bloom, which- <laughs> Unrelated. <laughs> unrelated, no relation, even though they sound similar. They took the Bloom model and they modified it and they retrained it with their own data. And of course, Bloomberg is a data company. They have access to very special data and created something called Bloomberg GPT that is proprietary. And they published an academic paper alongside it and wrote in the paper that this would not have been possible had they needed to start from scratch writing the model architecture before they trained it. Right. So it's like, okay, sure, whatever they're going to use is slightly less sophisticated than GPT-4, 
But first of all, their data is their big competitive advantage anyway, and they don't want to give it up to GPT-4. So given the data is driving it, maybe they don't, you know, they can use something slightly less sophisticated and on open source. And then there's, I guess, a further argument that using the open source thing, they're able to do other things besides just training on their data that might make it more useful to them. That's right. And, you know, Runway is another example of this, that Runway creates AI-enabled video editing, film editing. They were used to edit the film Everything Everywhere All at Once, which won Best Picture at the Oscars, a bunch of other exciting things like this. And in order to create that functionality, there was no off-the-shelf proprietary model available when they started building Runway. So instead, they started contributing to open source and working with the open source community to actually create altogether new capabilities that push the technical envelope. I used to work at Bloomberg, you know, and in running sort of a very small sort of financial news upstart. And it feels like I should be able to disrupt them with new technology, but it's amazing given sort of the data advantages that they have this huge data set. In some ways, it's possible that AI really just helps, you know, the huge incumbents because they've learned everything, you know, Bloomberg about the financial world. Do you think like AI will end up being a tool helping the incumbents stay in place, right? I mean, I think Sam Lesson made an argument that, you know, in the mobile revolution, people thought it would be great for startups, but like, you know, Facebook and Google figured it out. There's an argument, you know, that the incumbents will figure out AI and in some ways benefit more from it than startups. Do you have a point of view on that? I would say that there are four kinds of strengths that you can have in AI to lend themselves to larger companies, typically, to, to startups. So the four sources of strength that I can see are access to customers, or empathy with customers, rather, access to talent, access to data, and access to compute. Access to data and compute are brute force kinds of assets right. that somebody like Bloomberg might have more access to than an upstart. But customer empathy and access to special talent, our industry learns again and again hmm. that startups are really well positioned in that. And, hmm. and that's how David's beat Goliath. Yeah, you got to figure out what your customers want. Because the big company grows out of touch with it and sort of think so I hand down to them what they should want and it becomes a less desirable place to work probably because you're lost in a huge bureaucracy. All that stuff. So the advantages of startups are understanding their customers better than anybody else and attracting the most ambitious, impatient, optimistic, slightly crazy talent and small teams can change the world like that. So we're talking about the Bloomberg example. We came on to this because the thesis is tons of activity in open source. And this was an example of them applying open source LLMs to build their proprietary financial, I don't know, what do we call it? Model, I guess. What else is happening in open source right now that's worth flagging? So there's a model that's been released by Databricks called Dolly, which is a cloning joke. D-O-L-Y, Dolly. And now comes Dolly 2.0, which is, unlike the first one, Dolly 2.0 is licensed for commercial use. It was so you can just take with, it and start building. Take it and start building. And the creation of Dolly and Dolly 2.0 is almost funny in the sense that Databricks used off-the-shelf tools from Databricks they used a relatively small amount of data. They used a two-year-old open source architecture and 30 to 60 minutes of training time, hmm. which is a small amount of compute. And we're able to demonstrate, I haven't seen the quantification, but what Databricks describes as remarkable performance relative to ChatGPT. Databricks itself is like an open source company that has proven that it can build sort of profitable things around it. I mean, wait, it's in the data lake business, right? I mean, 
My sense with Databricks is that it's like a use case where businesses don't necessarily want to have to do the thing that Databricks provides. And so like it's, you know, safer to build this around this open source technology. But I mean, do you think this Dolly effort is just brand building for them or like do you think it's something they're going to be able to monetize around? And I guess the bigger question is independent of Databricks, are you optimistic about companies that sort of facilitate open source projects monetizing around those projects? So Databricks is brand building and they're also making a point that notwithstanding all the fear that may be there and the intimidation of these sophisticated technologies, here is a cookbook. Here is a recipe to create your own fine-tuned chat GPT model that understands your own data. Think about a company that needs to enable its customer service agents with data from its own private knowledge graph. And Databricks is trying to make a point that you need not be as sophisticated as OpenAI to actually start to do this for yourself. With that, Databricks hopes that customers will say, okay, well, I'm going to use Databricks tooling to do that. Why is it Dolly? Like, it's because they're cloning... They're cloning like chat Dolly? GPT. Yeah. They're cloning like chat. Dolly, well, Dolly. there is something, there is a D-A-L-L-E image right. model. I don't think right. this, that's a reference to that. I think oh, the okay. reference, I imagine the reference is to cloning chat GPT. <laughs> right. It's a joke. It is amazing overall. Like... OpenAI wants to protect, you know, it's not publishing as much. There is more of an effort to be proprietary. But I don't know. In the air, like so many OpenAI people leave. You know, I interviewed David Luan at Adept and I saw that their head of product just went to Spark to invest. Like, it feels like there's so much like leakage of knowledge out into the rest of the startup world. Like, unless OpenAI just starts suing people all over the place, does it feel like they're really trying to hold on to their secrets or they're letting them sort of filter out? I think the core way that knowledge gets distributed in this part of the world is through papers and code. Yeah. And OpenAI publishes less of both than their peers at Google and DeepMind and Amazon and what have you. Yeah. The Economist had a really nice chart about this that showed the pace of academic publications in AI from a few top labs and a few top universities. You don't think whispers are enough? It's not enough for somebody to be able to like go get coffee and be like, oh, we're probably doing this sort of like it being in a paper makes it much just is a big difference. There is an open source model called Whisper from OpenAI, <laughs> which is not what, it's thing, not what you're talking about. Not but at all. The, <laughs> the human leakage of information, yes, knowledge wants to be free. Right. But it's not the same thing. Yeah. So. Interesting. And as another indication of the pace here, Eric, Clem DeLong, the Hugging Face CEO, tweeted just today that since the launch of ChatGPT, there have been more than 200,000 open source models posted to Hugging Face. I mean, it's insane what people can build. Like, I mean, I was reading about someone who recreated their like friend group chat using, you know, stuff that was just available and just cobbling it together and sort of put out a whole recipe for that. It still feels like no one has recreated GPT-4, right? In open source. I mean, that's sort of the big thing that's still looming all over all of this. Like wh how close will open source come to replicating GPT-4? I don't hear a lot of people claiming that open source is going to get to the frontier of capability anytime soon. Yeah. And depending on who you ask, the frontier of open source is anywhere from six to 36 months behind the frontier of proprietary. Yeah. But you also, I think it was Ben Stansel who wrote about a labor market for AI models recently. Hmm where not every task needs to be performed by the same model. Right. We see in a medical setting or what have you. So you're going to start to see ensembles where these things can be mixed and matched. And you can optimize for benefits of latency or cost or fine tuning versus off the shelf or what have you. 
And the other point is that as the pace of the open source models increases, they will become useful for more and more of the ensemble application. Right. What's the state of like chaining things together, <laughs> I guess, is a key piece of all of this. Like, I mean, Lang Chain being sort of the zeitgeisty company around that. I don't totally understand all the chain. What's it mean to piece all these models together? And like, what's sort of the state of the art at the moment there? There's two kinds of concepts here. One is called chaining, where I can actually ask a sequence of prompts of a model. And the model will remember as context the questions and answers that came before it. So think about asking in chat GPT, who were the last five presidents of the United States? And then in the next question, asking what were their ages when they left office? Right. You don't need to repeat the question that you just asked. It's going to know that you referred to the presidents of the United States. Because that's memory built in that particular system. But it, you're saying that's effectively a type of chain? That is a chain. So you can okay. actually chain together prompts and build up context for more sophisticated types of inference. Yeah. There is also a concept that's old and well understood in machine learning called an ensemble, where instead of using one single model for everything, we can actually use a combination of models for slightly different parts of our application. Right. And you can make either really broad brush decisions that certain kinds of questions always go to model A and others always go to model B, or you can make more fine grained decisions that parts of each operation may go to model A versus B versus C. Right. And so one reason that's useful is like, oh, this seems like an easy task. We'll send it to our cheap model. And this seems like a hard task. We'll send it who are expensive. That's right. You hear that talked a lot about. But then there's also that people are trying to create sort of a thinking process for these machines. Even though like LLMs fundamentally are just generating like they're filling in the blank. It's sort of like, let's fill in the blank. But at the same time, there's an effort by sort of piecing them together to create more of like a thinking pattern that we're structuring. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, these large models are trained on a huge corpus of facts, but they're actually best thought of as reasoning machines, not fact machines. And for a question like the president of the United States, they're going to be able to get it right, typically. But for more fine-grained facts that, were, that really matter as the crux of a decision, what you actually want to do is feed those facts into the model as part of the chain. This is the data stack. You can use any part of a database technical stack to retrieve that information. So let's take an example. Let's say that Eric Newcomer wants to take a trip from New York to LA. Now, the LLM could reason that the steps to do that are find out what are his preferences and then find out what flights match those preferences and then suggest a bunch of options that match the preferences yeah. in that order. But at each step, it's going to now need to retrieve information and know, you know what? This one database says, Eric likes to fly on Delta, and here's his Delta number. And then in the next link in the chain, say, I'm going to call out to some API and retrieve the set of Delta flights on a certain date that Eric has specified. This is sort of a fun way. We're building out like sort of the AI Expedia or whatever in some ways here. That's right. Like if I'm a if I'm a company that's building the AI Expedia, I'm just thinking aloud here. I haven't really thought this through before. On the one hand, I have plenty of time to think about it. So it makes sense for me to build out each step because I'm like, oh, you know, I know you're gonna it's gonna search for your preferences, search for the flight, blah, 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 blah. But alternatively, I guess part of the appeal of, you know, the as large language models is they think about things differently than us and like they are surprising answers and maybe they decide not to in one point trust our preferences because they should be overrated. Like, I guess, how do you sort between where humans should impose the structure while turning over some of the questions to the LLM versus just like 
the black box approach. I think the co-pilot metaphor that Microsoft uses ends up being the answer to that, that depending on the sensitivity of the operation, before I spend X thousand dollars on a plane ticket, I'd like to probably see the answer before I book it or before I you know, make some large hedge fund financial transaction with this kind of technology. I might like to actually see what it wants to do and what are the steps that it went through to get there. Yeah, you don't want to just say, okay, go ahead. The ultimate let it run sort of application is this, what is it, baby AGI you were telling me about? Or like, I've seen some of it on Twitter, but this is sort of a, the fun cutting edge of the moment. What is baby AGI? Baby AGI is the creation of somebody named Yohei Nakajima, who is a VC investor who's curious <laughs> and invented a, you know, he what he says, if you look at him on Twitter, or you look at some of the speaking he's done, he heard all these references to GPT-4 being everybody's ideal co-founder. And he said, what if I could cut out the human entirely and make it the founder? Right. So he created a program that uses GPT to define its own tasks and then order the tasks and then execute the tasks while reordering them. And you could set the first instruction to say, baby AGI, create a company. And baby AGI will decide that the first step is to create a business plan. And in order to do that, it needs to look up what are the key elements of a business plan. And it will create this stacked order of tasks and then start executing them one by one and eventually even spit out a Google Doc with a business plan for the company that it wants to create. And then it can move on to registering a domain name and registering a company with Stripe Atlas. And but it, it hits the limits of what it can actually, like it can't interact with Stripe Atlas right now, right? Or... Well, LLMs can actually talk to APIs. This is like plugins and yeah. With GPT plugins are an example of that. There, there are a bunch of examples, but just in the same way that applications using LLMs can retrieve data, they can actually call out to other APIs to take actions as well. Right. And this gets back to your question about under what circumstances should we allow them to do that? This is where it really gets terrifying because this is where it's like, okay, yeah, I mean, a, an AI could, if it's just prompting itself over and over again, can convince itself it should do something nefarious to build a business or there are lots of profitable legal businesses, you know, and a, sure. a Silk Road uh, 2.0 or whatever, you know. But yeah, I guess it's felt to me like its connection with the outside world has been the barrier, like, can AI really like, can it build a business yet? Or like, could it accept a payment yet? Like it feels like doing that on its own feels. I would say that I don't hear too many people worried about that part yet. Right. I would turn it upside down and say that agents and retrieval and access to APIs have created a really powerful new way for founders to differentiate their apps because for founders who either may choose to use some open source model or a proprietary model, until now, that deep level of science was one of the few ways that they could actually build something defensible that other people could not easily copy. And we've seen any number of examples of that. But now, when these apps that are running on top of LLMs, FMs, whatever you want to call them, now the founders can actually bring in data that is special and can let their apps talk to external APIs that are special. Hmm. And that, that lets the apps riding on top become much more powerful. You use the term agent, which I'm hearing more and more. Is that like an AI persona or how do we think about agents or how do you define it's being used in a few different ways, but baby AGI is one example of an agent concept, which is a little persona that is taking an autonomous chain of actions that may be the only chain running, 
or maybe one of multiple chains. If I can extend our Expedia example from before, Eric, I could say I might have one chain that's working on flights and another one that's working at hotels. One agent that's working at flights right. and another agent that's working at hotels. It's all amazing to me. The baby AGI example in particular, I mean, if you keep it running, first of all, that's like going to cost like a ton of money, right? I mean, that's a real constraint at the moment. Take, building a business takes 30 years, and if baby <laughs> AGI takes that long, it'll run up a big bill. Yeah. It feels in some ways like humans are like cobbling together like a brain in public, right? It's like, okay... There's the model, but then we're going to chain it to this thing where, you know, it, it just feels like at some point, you know, there, there are these systems where it's like, I mean, just like a human brain, like a key piece of the human brain is that there are different ways of thinking, like sort of interconnected with each other and in sort of inscrutable ways. Like it's just fascinating to me that we're just cobbling together sort of machine intelligence in ways we don't totally understand. Yeah. But, you know, if I pop back up, all of this is in service of building applications that are really useful. I right. heard somebody somebody made an example yesterday that the ones who invented refrigeration made some amount of money, but not as much as Coca-Cola. <laughs> yeah. And this happens throughout history, like clockwork. Within 10 months of launching the iOS App Store, we saw Uber, which could not have existed without the App Store, but was not a very sophisticated app. And so... Our industry is trying to do two things at once. Number one, we're trying to create a stable enough platform. And number two, we're trying to imagine what is the Uber or the Coca-Cola right. that will sit on top of that platform. And there is great work to be done in both of those areas. I feel like the Coca-Cola refrigerator one's interesting because in some ways the refrigerator is the platform and Coca-Cola is the app. And I feel like the old school venture capitalist thinking was you want to be the platform. Like if you can be Apple with the app store or, you know, Facebook with everybody integrating it, you know, that's better than being sort of this great app. Do you disagree with that or do you disagree specifically in AI? I come from a company in my last job that built a very successful platform. And you can certainly right. do that. And yeah, exactly. The, the Coca-Cola... Both sides, I mean, both pieces. You can certainly do it. And look, Coca-Cola, you know, has a, a trucking platform as well. And so there are platform businesses to be built. I just think that there are, by definition, an infinity of applications to be built on top of this new technology. And so it is, by definition, bigger, even though the platform is really exciting and there's really important work to do. If you go back to the bottlenecks that I mentioned before, there is a bottleneck for talent and data and silicon. And platforms allow us to channel silicon and talent, at least, so that teams that may have only modest levels of technical skill can still bring their own visions to life. Hmm. And that's really important because if you believe, as I do, that the best ideas are going to be randomly distributed, you want whoever has the idea for Coca-Cola or Uber or whatever to be able to use the tools and to be able to access them so that they can bring that vision right. to life. Right. That's the mission our industry is on right now. The amount of like sophistication... Like it feels like the amount of progress that's happening in terms of the actual models is far outpacing sort of the normal business world's ability to like integrate them into their businesses. I mean, would you agree with that? Like, are there a lot of customers circling back to sort of the opener of this conversation for Bedrock or it's like big enterprises just like like to know it's there? How quickly do you think Coca-Cola, great, will be able to, you know, figure out ways to use these foundation models in their business. I could be wrong. Now that you mention it, I didn't plan this. I think Coca-Cola actually yeah, they were mentioned like... that they a partner of OpenAI yeah, or something like true. that. Yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. Yeah, I'm glad you brought them up. Yeah. But it's meaningfully it's, implement. Yeah. It is high on the agenda of everybody because it's 
you know, what I'll say is sweeping it up to be disprovable the next time we do this, but it feels that virtually every kind of application in virtually every industry will be either reimagined or rebuilt with this kind of technology. It's that impactful. It is categorically different than other things that came before it. In the Coca-Cola example, I mean, which food brand is going to be the first to be like, this is the model, you know, the model said the Coke recipe should be like this. And it's like new Coke is just like machine Coke or whatever, you know, the marketing value of that. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if there's a backlash to that sort of idea. But yeah, I mean, I forget if it was TikTok or Twitter, but I've seen people. Yeah, I think it was on TikTok. Someone had fed in their recipe to ChatGPT and said, okay, what would level this up? And it was like, oh, you should add jalapenos for a little spice and like something for texture. And so, you know, then they out, you know, created some really pretentious, you know, bite and they liked it. I don't know. Yeah. It would be fascinating. Almost anything I've tried using chat GPT for, you know, personal expense management and project management and debate. You can sort of have an argument with it and sharpen your debating skills, you know, as well as defining task lists and, so it's, I think the other key thing to think about here, Eric, is that in previous generations of technology, we treated computer science as an engineering task, something to be calculated and optimized. And in AI, we treat the models as almost biological organisms that need to be treated with hypotheses hmm. and experiments just to understand what's possible because we don't know what the frontier is going to be. I think I said this on stage at Cerebral Valley, but mid journey, like, you know, there was a sense that like they went from six fingered hands to like five fingered hands and they didn't quite understand why, you know, and that's what gets everyone terrified, I guess, again, about a, like a chat GPT five or whatever. It's, we don't totally understand the models. And if we just like add more power, new stuff could emerge and we have no sense of why that's the case. I mean, are you, do you worry about that? I think we need to be really responsible in how we observe and manage and respond to these things. It seems like the only way to do that is by going through as opposed to somehow pulling back. It's going to be built. <laughs> So let's figure it out. We should lean in hard and put our best minds and our best thinking on confronting these questions so that we can answer them. Cool. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really do need to figure out how like newcomer, I want to, the, it's hard to access news, like to apply it to my own newsletter. I haven't totally figured, I did interview prep with it, but I need to get more creative in how I can apply it to my sub stack. The very best part is it's so complicated that it can only be learned in public together. Right. Great. Cool. Thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. That was my episode with John Turo at Madrona. I'm Eric Newcomer. Thanks so much for Tommy Heron, our editor, Riley Kinsell, my chief of staff, and Young Chomsky, who provides the music. Thanks to Vanta for sponsoring. Check us out on our YouTube channel at Newcomer Pod on YouTube. Newcomer.co is the Substack. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Newcomer. And like, comment, subscribe, review on Apple Podcasts if you can. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.